Anyway, it's living for Jesus when it's fun and when it's not. Now, maybe they, I, don't want, I don't mean that to sound irreverent or sacrilegious, like, it's not fun living for Jesus. Shall we be honest? And shall we just be open and frank? Sometimes it's not fun living for Jesus. <laughs> There's things that come our way that are hard, uh, challenging for us. And, um, but we have to learn to live for Jesus either way. And, and the, the fourth verse here of this song, In the Cross of Christ I Glory, says, Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure by the cross are sanctified. And the, the, the verse I was going to read to open our, our uh, worship service this morning was Galatians 6.14, But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And we were going to sing a song that we sing fairly often, It's Still the Cross. Because the cross is our motivation. Whether the times are good or bad, whether it's fun or whether it's not, we look to the cross. So just tying all that a little bit together for you here this morning. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll begin looking into Acts chapter 3 here this morning. Father, we are grateful to be here today. So thankful for the, the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation we have in Him, which makes us a part of your church. This is the local expression of your larger church, and we're grateful for the family of believers we have here. So grateful for the love we have for one another and the love together we have for you. And we do love you and, and so thankful that you first loved us, that we might love as well. Father, I just pray that as we, as we face life, the days ahead, we know from past experience that there are good times and there are what we would call bad times. You always have a purpose in it all. And you are always good through it all. Um, but we have high moments and low moments. We have pain and pleasure. We have times when it's fun and times when it's not. But we need to serve you faithfully through all of it, recognizing that though we might feel that our role is small, that our role is pretty insignificant in the big picture, it's not to you, and it shouldn't be to us either. There's tremendous value and little when you're in it. And so we pray that you'll show us that afresh here this morning and encourage our hearts. And we look forward to, to, to what you're going to do. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So yeah, if you're not already there, then you can turn to the book of Acts and we're going to look at chapter 3. This is a message that actually covers Acts chapter 3 and 4 pretty much. However, we're not going to cover all of that. <laughs> Um, this morning, in fact, this, it's a three-point message. I'm only going to get through the first point this morning. So, uh, but first of all, let me just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date myself a little bit here because I'm going to refer in the opening here to the Andy Griffith Show. Anybody who knows me knows I love the Andy Griffith Show. I just want you to know that it was created before I was born. I, I want you to know that. But um, I, just, there's something about the humor of the Andy Griffith Show that just, I don't know, I love it. It's just, I connect with it. And I think it's, it's fun. I can watch the same episodes over and over again, see the same scene over and over again, and laugh every time. And um, so I get a big kick out of it. Um, so I recall one Andy Griffith episode in which the, the regulars on the show are sitting around Andy's house and they're discussing some of the notable things that they have accomplished in their life. Andy, for example, as I can't remember, as a third or fourth string end, caught a touchdown pass. And that was like a high moment in his life. Goober had won a pancake eating contest, and he was very proud of that. Howard dropped everything on a whim and moved to the Caribbean and was going to have a life there in the Caribbean. He discovered it wasn't all that it was cracked up to be, so he came home, found out that his pot of gold was at this end of the rainbow, not that end of the rainbow. Helen had won a spelling bee in Kansas got some people from Kansas here. Helen's from Kansas. And um, she won a spelling bee, having spelled the word hors d'oeuvres. Um, well, that's, that's a feat, I can tell you. <laughs> um, and I, had to, I had to look it up. It's in my notes. I had to look it up to know how to spell it, because I couldn't. Uh, I knew something like horse derbies. <laughs> but I, but um, <laughs> at any rate, Aunt B is listening to all this discussion, and she's the hostess, you know, and she's going to feed them all and all this, that, and the other. But she's 
she's just kind of bummed because she has no high moment to really share with the rest of them. And it inspired her to take flying lessons. Yes, Aunt B was going to fly solo. She is determined, and she did it. Um, I don't know that Frances Bavier ever did anything of the sort, but Aunt B on the show certainly did. Now, whole, you know, all of us have something like that, no doubt. Maybe you're like Aunt B. Sorry, I don't mean to offend you this morning, but but you have something like that that you you point to. That's kind of the high point of your life, or a real just an achievement that you're kind of proud of and and glad that you had. Hopefully, they go beyond things like pancake eating contests. Um, and hopefully, there's some some other things you have to point to. For me, both the highs and the lows, the fun and the not so fun are all centered around vocational ministry. And maybe even for you, it's, it's, it has to do with the, the you know, the, 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 your, your ministry. You're not in vocational ministry, but you have a ministry, you've had some opportunities that are just really excited you, and then some disappointments that just really, really discouraged you. So hopefully we have some great joys and perhaps some great sorrows that revolve around more serious accomplishments or disappointments. But none of us have ever quite reached a high like Peter's. When he preached a message under the power of the Holy Spirit and 3,000 souls came to faith in Jesus at that time. What an incredible experience that must have been. But not every opportunity that Peter had was so notable. And not every outcome of his faithful service resulted in what he would call fun or excitement, didn't necessarily yield enthusiasm. In fact, there were times when it just wasn't fun. And life is just not all mountaintops. That's, that's just reality. There's going to be the valleys. But the fact of the matter is, through the good times, through the bad, when it's fun, when it's not, Christ had left Peter. He had left the early disciples a promise and it's a promise that extends to today. It's for you and I right now. And it's a promise that's there till Jesus comes. And he said, he said when he gave them the Great Commission that he would be with them to the ends of the earth, to the end of the age. So God wants you to serve him always, when it's fun and when it's not to the end of the age, or till your death, whichever comes first. Well, what, what realities in life, what, what realities of life and ministry present challenges to serving Christ in all circumstances? Well, that's, that's what we've been looking at here. There's, there's many. We couldn't possibly exhaust the, all the potential answers to that question. But in Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 4, we find three different realities, I guess you would say, that presented challenges to this quest of serving God under all circumstances. And we have to assess these things correctly, these realities of life correctly, if we are to serve God faithfully. If we assess them wrongly, we're going to get derailed. Okay, so let's, let's begin looking, and I said we're just going to get to the first one here this morning. Personal evangelistic opportunity is just as important as mass evangelistic opportunity. <laughs> we already talked about the mass evangelistic opportunity that Peter had. As he speaks there at Pentecost at the time when the Holy Spirit came, and, and what precipitated it all, of course, was that, that when, when the people, the crowd, saw the disciples, at least, we're not exactly sh sure who all were, were speaking in tongues, but at least the the, the disciples are speaking in tongues, and, and they were accused of being drunk. That was one of the explanations. How these, these people have been drinking. And, um, but Peter goes on to use that then as a platform from which to speak and to, to, to address that, that question. And he goes on and he preaches a, a sermon, and that's when 3,000 were saved. What an amazing, amazing event. So we look at something like that, and we think, wow, that, that's just incredible. And there's been more contemporary examples of similar type things, maybe not 3,000, but where just a lot of people were saved in, in one event. Those things seem to be more and more rare in our culture as time goes on. 
But this is, this is something we have to understand, that you know what? Those great opportunities like Peter had, those great opportunities that more contemporary servants of God have had, where they've had great opportunities to preach the gospel in front of a lot of people. Um, hey, the, our, our little opportunities are just good. You know, one of the, one of the I guess, it, in, my, in my case, probably the, the, the best opportunity I had to preach in front of unbelievers was probably when I spoke years ago now, before about 200 men in the Baltimore Rescue Mission in Baltimore, Maryland. And I do count it as a great opportunity. It was a joy <clears throat> for several reasons for me to be able to do that, but to my knowledge, no one came to faith in Christ. And that doesn't mean the opportunity wasn't still valid and good. Because our opportunities, that's all we can do is be stewards of the opportunities God gives us. It's not up to us to save people. So, so the opportunity is the same whether people get saved or not. And so I'm thankful for the opportunity, and it was, it was a joy to be able to do it. Um, but that's, that's, I mean, that's, in my life, that's, that's the greatest opportunity I've ever had. Most, most Christians don't have an opportunity even like that, to speak in front of 200 unbelievers and give the gospel to them. So does that mean that the other opportunities are second rate? That somehow they're not as valid, not as important? Well, we're going to see here in chapter 3 that there are both types of evangelism. So go ahead, let me just start here by reading verses 1 to 11. And then we'll pause for a moment and uh, we'll see if we get beyond that. But, but uh, Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who enter the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, Look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So here we have a personal evangelism opportunity in verses 1 through 11. So let's consider first of all the setting. The Peter and John are, 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 are going to pray. Um, this, was a, this was Jewish tradition to pray three times a day. Um, extends way back and, and, and there's, some, there's some debate as to whether or not the, the, the earlier tradition was necessarily, uh, and, and, and the later traditions were all necessarily for the exact same reasons, but I, I have no reason to believe they're not. Daniel prayed three times a day, remember. Um, so there were actually three, uh, three different hours of prayer that Jews kept traditionally, the third, the sixth, and the ninth. The, their days began at 6 a.m. So the third hour of the day would have been 9 a.m., the sixth hour was noon. And the ninth hour, which is the hour we're talking about here, is three o'clock in the afternoon. So I, I just think one thing we take from this is to recognize that the, that the early disciples, they were now Christians, okay? They were believers in Jesus Christ. They were actually, okay, so they're still Jewish by heritage, but they're not Jewish. Okay, they're Christians now, okay? Um, but they didn't just forsake all their Jewish traditions. They still had an appreciation for that, and rightfully so. I think it's perfectly valid and perfectly okay. I don't think they were legalistic about it. They just kept some of those traditions because they were meaningful to them. But I think there may have been some other reasons why they continued to keep some of those traditions. And that was that it afforded them more opportunities to have a ministry with Jewish people. Certainly they did in this case. They're to the temple to pray. They didn't have to go to the temple to pray. They could pray anywhere. Jesus taught that clearly. But they go to the temple to pray. It's a, it's, a, it's a 
A mentality that the Apostle Paul also had. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, of verse 19. Forgot to get my verse sheet out here. Just let me pull that out here. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 22 says, For though I am free from all men, this is the Apostle Paul speaking here, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might, be Jew, might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under the law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So, that doesn't mean that Paul became worldly to reach the world. That, that's not what that means at all. But he can adjust himself to various cultural differences and things of this nature that have nothing to do with right and wrong. Sin or not sin, worldly or not worldly. He can, do, he can dive into those things and, and sometimes have an opportunity with, with people because of it. So perhaps that's part of the motivation that Peter had and others had, that we're going to still continue to keep some Jewish traditions and we are going to use them as opportunities. So here's the setting, and we're really kind of still moving on with the whole setting here, but we're going to move on to the specific opportunity here in verse 2. Here's a man who had been born lame. He was taken daily to the beautiful gate there at the temple, a strategic spot for the purpose of asking for alms because it was a high traffic area. People like Peter and John going to pray. And you kind of get the idea here that he's probably used to sitting there begging for alms and, and way more often than not, not receiving anything. <laughs> might have been a pretty, uh, there might have been days when he walked away with nothing. I don't know that. I'm just, I'm just kind of putting myself in the scene and kind of uh, considering what it might have been like. But he's, he's taken there daily by Others who he's dependent upon. You know, it kind of makes you wonder if at some point in his life, if this was a daily ritual, that he had an, encou had an encounter with the Lord Jesus. It, it becomes apparent as, we've, as the story unfolds that he, he knew who he was, but apparently to this point had not had opportunity to interact with Jesus on a level to where Jesus could have healed him. Perhaps his heart... Is, I don't know, we don't have no idea what was going on in his heart, his receptivity to Jesus and so forth. But here he is, sitting at the beautiful gate, asking alms. And in verse 3, we find a request here. He sees Peter and John, who they're, they're on their way, they're about to, to get there to the temple to pray. And he asks them for alms. Now even now, there's no evidence that, that healing of a physical nature is on his mind. It seems that he's, he's only concerned about receiving some money. That's understandable. I'm not being critical of him for that. <laughs> he, he needed money, and, and uh, he's dependent upon others for it, and so he's asking for alms. It's, that's not the problem here, but I'm just pointing out, there's no real evidence that he's seeking physical healing from them. Just wants alms. And so Peter replies in verses 4 to 7. Peter says, it's interesting what he does first. He, he, he fixes his eyes on him, so he, he's listening. Now, this is, this is notable right here. Peter, remember, just got off, not long ago, a, a message in which 3,000 souls came to Christ. Peter could have an ad attitude at this point that says, that's just ignoring people individuals, ignoring the small opportunities, ignoring this kind of situation, because after all, he's a preacher that can reach 3,000. Okay, now, Peter never had that attitude, and we'll see that here in a moment, too. But I'm saying he could have had, he could have had that kind of arrogance, that kind of like, wow, this is the big stuff. This is where I need to put my attention, on the opportunities to preach to crowds. I wonder how many people walked by that man didn't even look at him, didn't give him any attention at all, probably most, but not Peter. He stops, and he fixes his eyes on this man, as does John. And Peter says with John, look at us. So he gave them his attention. 
And you get the idea here that this, this gives him some hope now. He's been crying for alms for a while, perhaps, in this day already. <laughs> and to no avail. And, and now he's got somebody's attention. Somebody's got his attention. Their, their, their eyes have connected here. So he has some expectation now to receive something from them. And then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. I wonder if that was like kind of like uh, a sad thing to hear <laughs> from, for this guy. But it doesn't, at the same time, he doesn't just shut him off. I mean, Peter says, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand. Peter took this, this man by the hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So what is it that Peter had to give to the man? He says, I don't have money, but what I have I'll give you. What did he have? Well, okay, our first thought was, okay, well, the gospel. But interestingly here, Peter didn't sit down and give him a gospel presentation. He didn't say, you know what, you're a sinner, young man, or however old he is. You're a sinner. Your sin estranges you from God. Jesus, you might have seen him around here from time to time, <laughs> who was crucified, rose again. And uh, he did that for you. And you need to put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you need, to, you need to be saved. No, there would have been nothing wrong with Peter doing that, of course, but that's not what we see here. What did Peter have to give to him? <clears throat> I'm, not, I'm not taking the gospel away from it. I think it's there, okay? But it's just not quite in the terms we would think it might be. Kenneth Friedrich says something that perhaps <clears throat> shed some light on this in regard to what did Peter have to give him. He says, what a powerful possession it is. Whatever Peter possessed, it's a powerful possession, he says. And he says, it's the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit of God and the master's own promise to bless and extend Peter's service. I think that's interesting. Now, Peter, now, again, it includes the gospel. That, that's what they were commissioned with. They were commissioned with the gospel. But they had the promise of the Holy Spirit to go with them. Jesus' very presence to be with them. They were given a stewardship of the gospel with the power of the Holy Spirit behind it. And a promise that Christ would be with them. And, and, and Christ had given Peter a specific commission again. Remember? He'd given it to him before. But after Peter's denial and that opportunity that Christ had to restore him and ask him three times, Peter, do you love me? And he said, feed my lambs. Feed my sheep. He was recommissioned. This is what Peter had. And you and I, well, you and I have the same commission. Right? To go out and share the gospel with people. So there was no presentation of the gospel to this man at this point, nor was there a call for him to exercise faith in Jesus, at least not in terms we are familiar with. What did Peter say? In the name of Jesus Christ, of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So it, it's, it's, in a sense, it's a call to faith. He's, he's asking him, to, he's giving him a command here. Is the, how's the man going to respond? Is he going to respond in faith? In this Jesus? In the name of Jesus? Or is he not? Well, as we move along here, we're going we're gonna to see that it's, it's clear that he did put his faith in the Jesus, in the name of Jesus. You see in verse 16? Now Peter here is giving explanation to others about how this man was healed. And we're going to see later again how he, he took no glory for himself. He, he did not take any credit for it. It was Jesus. And what does he say here? And his name. He's talking about Jesus. And his name. Through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. So as one commentator points out, in this verse, as elsewhere, the name stands for the person. Thus, faith in his name means faith in Christ. I think this man, apparently, he knew enough about Christ. He knew who he was. 
He knew what he'd done. So Peter, Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And then you find the response of the man. In verse 8, he leaped up, he walked, he entered the temple with Peter and John, walking and leaping and praising God. Just more, more indication of his faith in Christ. He's praising God. He's not praising Peter. <laughs> I'm, sure he, I'm sure he's grateful for Peter's role. But he's praising God. He knew God's the one that raised him here. His faith was in Christ. But there's some other results here in verses 9 to 11. The people saw him walking and praising God. They knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. What a tremendous, tremendous testament to the power of Christ before all these people. Of course, there's a little confusion about that. Peter's going to make it clear. But he says in verse 11, Now as the lame man was, who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, Greatly amazed. People are standing in amazement. Which actually now turned into another opportunity for mass evangelism. Okay. Look at verses 12 to 26. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that the Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who has preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of the restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whether whatsoever he says, says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear the prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. Now you are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So here, <laughs> this opportunity for personal evangelism turns into an opportunity, another opportunity for mass evangelism. Now, don't make any mistakes here. That's not what made the personal evangelistic opportunity pertinent. That's not what made it worth it. No, it was worth it alone to see that lame man come to faith in Christ and not only be healed physically, but become a child of God spiritually. But at the same time, it did lead to another opportunity for Peter to preach. And I'm not going to go over this sermon. We just read it. I'm just going to catch a, a couple of high points from it. First of all, I think it's very noteworthy, as I mentioned a moment ago, that he took no glory for himself. Peter said, don't stand here amazed as though we did this in our power. It was not our power. It was through faith in the name of Jesus. No glory for self. Frankly, it was a very boldly convicting message. Did you note that in verses 13 to 15? Peter said, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. You denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. 
You killed the prince of life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Now, we all know that Peter was pretty bold at times, but let's remember as well that he was also the man who forsook Jesus. He was, many other disciples did too, but he denied that he knew him. The Holy Spirit now dwells Peter. He's a changed man. He is, he is bold for Christ here. These people, as we're going to... These people, as we're going to see here in a moment, are not happy with this message. The Jewish leadership had seen that Christ be arrested and, and, and crucified and put to death. And now Peter is indicting them and he's preaching that he rose from the dead. It's not what these, these people are anxious to hear. That's not the kind of message they're receptive to. But Peter still preaches it boldly. And yet it's gracious. Look at what he says in verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as did also your rulers. So he's not, it's, it's, <laughs> he's pretty bold, it's pretty convicting. And yet he acknowledges you did it in ignorance. Emphasize the, the prophecy that so much prophecy that foretold of Jesus. And we won't re rehash all of that, but the, these people revered the prophets. They, they respected the prophets. It just went over their heads when Jesus came. They didn't see him as the fulfillment of prophecy, but that's what Peter emphasizes again. This is, this is the fulfillment of the, of the prophecies that the prophets that you revere foretold. And he calls them to repentance in verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Well, what are the results of this preaching? That's where we get into the first few verses of chapter 4. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in, in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So, again, as I mentioned, Jewish leadership strongly objected to Peter's message. They had arrested him. They had executed him. They saw to it that he was put to death. They said that Jesus was a blasphemer. And now Peter and John were proclaiming his resurrection. So they threw them in jail overnight. It was already evening, no time for a trial. <laughs> Had to wait for the next day. And we're not told a whole lot about that, but however, we, we know that they were, they were released. But, but there's another result here. Many of those who heard the word believed. Being thrown in jail couldn't have been fun. <laughs> Not knowing what's going to happen to you. You don't even know what they did to Jesus. What might they do to his followers? Jesus had promised them, hey, if the world hates you, you know it hated me before it hated you. But having so many respond in faith was amazing. The estimated number of 5,000 likely includes the total number of new converts to that point. So there were 3,000 who responded to Peter's first sermon and probably a two, an additional 2,000 now responded this time for a total of 5,000. So as I mentioned a moment ago, boy, the, the best opportunity I've had to speak to a lot of unsaved people at once was that Baltimore rescue mission, but on the other hand, I've had multiple opportunities to share Christ with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. Both types of opportunities are a blessing. You know, I personally like the one-on-one -on -one opportunities because in those cases, you get to build a relationship with someone. And I think that's more conducive for the bigger picture of the Great Commission, where you not just giving the gospel, but you're making a disciple, you're continuing to disciple them life on life for life, right? 
So while mass evangelistic opportunity, those opportunities are great, and God certainly uses them and has used them throughout history, I believe the pattern most generally observed in Scripture is personal evangelism. Now, the early church, as we're, this is unfolding before our very eyes here in the early chapters of Acts, it got a tremendous jump start with these mass evangelistic opportunities. Here in a matter of a few weeks, 3,000 people, or 5,000, a total of 5,000 are saved. But the bulk of the early church's growth did not happen in large chunks like that but was a result of individual lives touching individual lives. Those people that were saved at Pentecost and here shortly after went back to their homes. Some of them were persecuted and scattered, and they continued to spread the gospel through personal evangelistic effort. And I think that's the bigger pattern you see in the Scripture. I think 1 Thessalonians 1, 5-8 is a good example. Paul says to the Thessalonians, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance, as you know what kind of men we were among you to your, for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. You people are a disciple-making people. You are a, a, a people who have taken the gospel and, and have spread it so much so that when we go places, your reputation has gone before you. Paul's ministry in Ephesus was characterized by this approach as well. He's speaking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, and he says in verse 20, that I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. There are those who take this passage or this verse and they, and, and it, don't, don't get me wrong here, hear me out. They justify door-to-door -door evangelism. Or in fact, they don't just justify it. They say, That's, this is why we must do door-to-door -door evangelism. Well, I'm sure that some door-to-door -door evangelism may very well have been done. But this is much broader than door-to-door -door evangelism. This is disciple-making. This is continuing to teach from house to house, home to home, person to person. The whole counsel of God. The bottom line is this. Don't think setting your sights on just one person that you could lead to Christ is insignificant. I'm going to throw out some numbers here. This is just for sake of illustration, okay? But even if one-tenth of the believers across the globe would share Christ with one, and if even one-tenth of those who had the gospel shared with them were to receive Christ, the number of new believers would surpass anything mass efforts could ever accomplish. The multiplication one-on-one, -on -one, life on life, multiplication process is by far the most effective, the most powerful way to see the gospel spread. And I think it's, generally speaking, God's primary pattern and way and method. Not to take away from the mass evangelistic opportunities, but that's not how the most, most people are saved. Please don't think I'm belittling mass efforts. But I can, I can tell you this. D.L. Moody was saved through personal evangelism. But then he was greatly, greatly used of God in mass evangelistic opportunity. I think that kind of illustrates how both are really, really valid and important. But let me ask you this. What kind of opportunity do you think you'll have Is there anybody here that expects to be able to preach the gospel to 500 people, 1,000 people? <laughs> Peter preached and 3,000 got saved. I wonder how many didn't. I mean, that would have, that would have been a large crowd. How, are we going to have those opportunities? Not likely. No, it's deflating. There's something about us that always wants the sensational. I remember having to tell my children as they're growing up, 
I mean, if, if God chose to use them in some powerful, big, massive evangelism way, or just, they were able to impact the globe through some amazing, something amazing, well, that would be his business. But that's just not reality for most of us. And I encourage my kids, don't, don't be thinking about some sensational thing you're going to do. The fact of the matter is just plan on being faithful to God every day, day in, day out, with the mundane, with the non-glamorous. And that's what God will use more than anything. Listen, most of us won't have those amazing opportunities, but we can be faithful. We can serve God when it's fun, when it's not fun. Now, this, this is one of the realities of life that we just have to assess correctly. Because if we don't assess it correctly, we won't serve God faithfully when it's fun, when it's not fun. Because frankly, this isn't, it's not as much fun, is it? <laughs> if you're going to have to just think about the, the mundane of every day, just being faithful and just seeking God for an opportunity for just one, just give me one. It's not as, that's just not as noteworthy. And yet it is. In God's eyes, it's incredibly noteworthy. For you, you're, some, so many of our church people here, you've got young families, and, and if you, you, you feel like, you, look, I've, got, I've only got time just, just to reach my family. Praise God. You are doing a tremendous work reaching your family. Don't, don't make light of that. That is profound, and it's wonderful. doesn't mean you shouldn't look for and seek an opportunity to share Christ with somebody outside your family, too, but if you just think, man, I just, this season of my life, I don't have a lot of opportunity. I get it. understand that. You have opportunity right there within the four walls of your home. Praise the Lord for that. So embrace any opportunity you can find for personal evangelism. Let me just give you a sneak preview of a message we'll preach in a couple of weeks since I'm on vacation next week. The rest of the message. Point two is persecution may follow fruitful ministry. That's just what you see in the early apostles' ministry, and it can, it can happen to us too. Even, even with that one person that we try to reach for Christ and we can turn around and they can, I mean, we can, we can end up with some level of resistance or persecution or whatever. Certainly, the church, by and large, I mean, in, in the bigger picture, in America and across the globe, it's getting hotter. <laughs> Resistance to Christianity. So we just got to understand that. But we've got to be faithful when it's fun and when it's not. Thirdly, in the latter part of chapter 4, we're going to find that prayer-filled fellowship amongst believers is invaluable. Because after they, these apostles experienced some persecution, they were able to come home and be with fellow believers who strengthened them incredibly. And we need to be that for one another in this endeavor to serve Christ and live for Him when it's fun and when it's not fun. We need each other. And what tremendous, tremendous strength there is in the fellowship of believers. We'll look at those in more detail in a couple of weeks. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the example we have of these early apostles are so grateful for their boldness and their enthusiasm and that they faithfully served you when they were seeing tremendous results. They faithfully served you when they had just small opportunities and when they were met with persecution. Some of them were thrown in prison and suffered other kinds of persecution and yet they were faithful. So thankful for the example of the early church that rallied around persecuted believers and were hospitable to one another and they were just such a blessing in prayer and ministry to one another. And we're so thankful that we have the privilege of, of being a blessing to one another as we are co-laborers together, soldiers together. So thank you so much for these things and these resources and for the truth we have. For the commission you've given us, help us just to be faithful to it all. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.